Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's session titled Ghost Nets Australia, Saltwater People Working Together. Uh, Ghost Nets Australia is an alliance of Indigenous communities across Northern Australia that have been working on a goal since 2004 to remove the coasts of deadly derelict fishing nets. So please join me in welcoming the presenters of this session to the stage, uh, Ms Jen Goldberg, Eli Tabua, Jane Blackwood and Philip Mango. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming and to listen to our bit of a problem. And I say thank you to the Loki people for letting us to give our speech here. Thank you very much. My name is Stanley Butt. Thank you, Stanley. Hi, so I'm Jen Goldberg. I'm the project officer for Ghost Nets Australia, and I'm talking here today with. Um, Eli Tabuai and Philip Mango from the Ma Mapun Land and Sea Ranges and the Naprinam um, Nanam Wantham Land and Sea Ranges and Jane Blackwood, the Land and Sea Ranger Coordinator. Um, okay, so we're actually representing an alliance. Uh, hang on, wrong button. <laughs> we're representing an alliance of different um, ranger organisations and art organisations from across the north of Australia. Um, 36, over 36 different organisations work with us on the ghost net issue from the Torres Strait Islands down the, um, down the western Cape of Cape York there, around the Gulf, up across the Arnhem Coast and into Western Australia over here. Um, and we're all working on this issue called ghost nets. We've been working together since 2004. Um, the issue's been around for a little bit longer than that. And Indigenous peoples have worked on the issue since before our program's inception. So what are ghost nets? Ghost nets are nets that fishermen lose at sea, either accidentally, for example, getting snagged on the bottom of the ocean or um, just swept overboard in a huge storm, or deliberately, where they're offcuts from nets or they're just old nets that get tossed overboard to go somewhere so people don't really think where somewhere might be. Um, these nets do what they're designed to do. They're invisible, you can't see them, and they drift around the oceans of the world still catching fish, except no one's pulling in the catch. So they go on catching, and the catch becomes bait, which then attracts more animals, and you end up with results that are not exactly what anyone would like to see. The area that, that we're talking about, the region, is is very important to marine turtles. In fact, six of the seven world species of marine turtles nest in this area. And since 2004, we've had 423 marine turtles that have been actually reported into our database, and this is representative of many, many more. Um, for example, Mapoon, 69, Naprinum, 139, Gumamathakal, 46, the list goes on from all our different ranger organisations have reported a loss of life from animals entangled within ghost nets. Sometimes we get there in time, we're lucky, and so are the turtles or the species that we can save. But it all depends on when we can get out to the beaches. One organisation that we partner with, the Naprinam Rangers, Nanam Wangtham, from just in the Weepa area, in 2008 recorded 62 turtles entangled within nets. 21 of those turtles could be released. 15 were already dead. Three died in rehab, but 26 could be rehabilitated and released which is always a good feeling. As I said before, we don't really know how many animals are dying in the nets. We know it's an underestimate, and that's because the nets are floating around the ocean for a long period of time. We've done a couple of prelim preliminary studies here. One in temperate waters very recently found that it takes six to eight days 
for an animal carcass such as a turtle carcass to decay out of a cage, this is put in colder waters. In our warmer waters in 2010, we found that in a similar cage to this cage, it only took three days for an entire medium-sized turtle carcass to decay out of the cage. So if you think about how long it might take a net that's been floating around that's made of plastics that don't biodegrade, um, those animals could be in the nets for a very long time. So the question is, what do we do with all these nets? And what kind of nets are doing this to the animals? Well, we work with the ranger groups, as I mentioned before, on fee-for-service arrangements, which Jane Blackwood will talk about later on. And we provide capacity building and training so that the rangers can go out and collect information for us. The kind of information that we receive looks like this. Eli and Philip will take you on a journey to tell you about what happens on a ghost net patrol. I'll just tell you about the end results at the moment. So we collect key diagnostic information that also gives us um, GPS exact point locations. For example, this is the old Marpoon region um, of where every net is in order to identify the nets. We have a resource that was put out by WWF in 2004 that enables us to identify the nets to a certain degree. For example, a vague idea of whether it's a trawl net or a gill net, and for example, where the country of manufacture would be, which is not necessarily the place where it's being used. When the data comes in, this is data from 2010 to 2012, and um, as a GIS, you can see that there's a lot, a very high dense area of nets up there. Sorry, I'm not very good with this pointer. Um, and over in this area as well. But the nets are ubiquitous. They go right around the Gulf of Carpentaria there. Similarly, we can also plot where the entanglements that are reported to us are. And similarly, they, they occur within the same hotspot regions. We also partner with CSIRO, which is Australia's Commonwealth Scientific Organisation. They used our data from 2004 to 2009, which was ranger collected data, to fit to a model which combined currents and wind and surface water temperatures and to retro plot the direction where the nets had actually come from. So this is nets that were collected off the beaches and then taken back to where their likely source would be. As you can see, there's, oh, <laughs> as you can see, there's a, um, there's a definite curl there around to the right in a clockwise kind of a gyre that's been identified in our area. The warmer the color, the more likely it is that a ghost net has used that path as it traveled on its way. And you can definitely see that the nets are coming in from this area here, which is the Arapura Sea, as they come down. Using more recent data, also the ranger collected data up until 2012, we've mapped our hotspots here on the beach using 15 kilometer grids. The red hotspot over here, which is Mapoon and Nafrinam and up to the Apudma area, and then over here in the Wessel Islands and coming down past Jimuru and Uralka and Anandiliakwa areas are all hotspot areas for nets. That means that they get a fair few nets. We work with fishermen. Australian fishermen are very, very keen to know where these nets are coming from and where they're actually going to. Australian nets account for less than 10% of the identified nets that we have. Our problem's not coming from Australia. This fisherman's fishing, fitting a satellite buoy to a ghost net. This is the track that that satellite took on with its attached to the ghost net up adjacent to the Torres Strait Island, down the western Cape York, across the bottom of the Gulf, and over to Arnhem Land, where it was picked up. And this pattern was repeated. So these ghost nets, they're different. They're not like the ones that Australian fishermen use. And they're coming to our shores in vast numbers. Over 12,000 ghost nets have been pulled off the beaches to date. That's a lot of nets, all different sizes. I missed one there, but. It's, it's basically, this is marine debris, photographs of the marine debris that we also have coming to our beaches. And these are labels that you won't see in any Australian supermarket, 
it's all stuff that comes from Southeast Asia. So our problem is uh, international. It's an international problem. And the question is, what are we going to do about it and where are we going to go? So locally, working with Indigenous Rangers, we can monitor what's happening on our country and our land. Um, internationally, we've begun working since 2012 with the ATSI, the Arafura Timor Sea Ecosystem Action Group, to try and work out um, work within fisheries within Southeast Asia, so from a regional perspective. Um, we've done three workshops in communities from around the Arafura Sea, and the outcomes of those workshops are proving interesting. The workshops from the fishermen all agree that there is a mass movement of currents southwards from the Arafura Sea, that the intensity of fishing in the Arafura Sea is very high. In fact, um, the Indonesian government classifies this area as an industrial scale fishery that there's multiple sources of fishing types that the nets could be coming from. They could come from trawl nets, gill nets, lift nets, purse seine nets, or fish trawl nets. Another big problem is that there's a lot of illegal and unregulated fishing that goes on in the Arafura Sea. Since 1986, this has resulted in a significant contribution to the ghost net issue. There's no enforcement or compliance of what goes on there. Basically, this, all these outcomes are pointing to something that means that ghost nets are a symptom of a bigger fisheries management issue that's occurring in our region, that we need to face it as a regional perspective and that we need to continue to explore it and to come up with strategies. We're so very close. At the moment, um, we're just gonna have to keep on working as much as we can while we still have the funding. Okay, well, next up, Eli and Philip are gonna take you on a ghost net patrol. I know that we have a lot of support out there um, from many of you that have also undergone these ghost net patrols in our area. Thank you. G'day, my name is Eli and um, Today I'm going to take you through basically our day-to-day -day routine when you go on a ghost net patrol. So um, yeah, because of our beaches are re uh, they're remote, um, uh, we have to barge our vehicles to to and from uh, to go and pull nets off the beach. Um, um, those are some of our exchange rangers that come from the Northern Peninsula area to uh, give us hand with pulling nets off the beach. And uh, some beaches, yeah, you can't get to by vehicle or by boat because of the distance. So that's why the chopper comes in and gives us a hand with that. Um, that's us um, transporting few quads um, across to go and pull nets off the beaches at uh, Cheney Creek. Ladies heading across to start pulling nets off the beach. Sometimes um, when the weather's rough, um, that's just how we got to get our um, equipment and vehicles across. The distance that you have to get to, sometimes in the swell season, it's so very rough that there's just no way you can get across. But that's the time when you really want to be on the beach, getting the turtles off the beach, because that's where they're getting entangled in the nets. And not just turtles, all the other species that we have out there as well. Um, when pulling nets, um, there, there are a few hazards, like the insulin um, salt water crocodiles, which are known to eat whatever moves people. Um, squid jigs, especially when you're pulling uh, nets out, very painful in your fingers. And uh, working in pairs for each other's safety. Um, 
just in case something goes wrong, you've got an extra person with you. Yeah, something went wrong there, so you get two people there, which is good. You're not doing it on your own. Um, that's at Skarden, uh, where we set camp. Um, takes about half an hour to get there by boat, and if you was to drive, it takes about eight hours. So we have to set a camp there and transport our equipment across, leave it at the camp to continue pulling nets. That's one of our other camps at Janey Creek, um, where we camp out to cross, uh, cross it over to the other beach to go and pull nets. Um, sometimes we can get them out by using the vehicles. Sometimes you gotta manually dig it out and just to make it easy for the people to pull it. Um, there are a few of our rangers pulling nets out, digging it out. Sometimes you can use the quads if they're really easy and loose to get out of the sand. These are, here's a few rangers probably from over this way, pulling our nets. And another group from over here somewhere, along here. That net, we happened to get it on time before it buried. So we got that net off the beach. A few more nets still on the beach. A few of our rangers pulling away. Uh, those are a few Arapoon rangers removing nets. Some nets are really big. As you can see, um, that lasso is pulling that net out. That's a net that we got out, and yeah, some nets do get very big. I remember one net we've done, it took us like six hours to get out of the sand, but we eventually got it. Here is a little gadget we call an eye tracker to collect data. And here's a sample of the sequence that we use to collect that data. Um, what we want to record the uh, net color, the strand type, uh, braided or twisted, mesh size, uh, measuring up to mesh size, and cutting samples. And it's also important that we do cut samples so that we can ID where the nets are coming from Uh, there's a bloke taking out a sample there. There's just a few of our rangers um, collecting data off that net. A few other rangers collecting data. Why do the work? teaching about why we do the work we do. Keep beaches free of nets, watch turtles hatch, protect animals, want to keep beaches clean. Here are some of our junior rangers um, on the turtle nesting, teaching them the... Oh, what do we do with the nets? Well, we used to burn them, but We've stopped doing that because of that. <laughs> yeah. So now we transport it back to um, our ranger base where um, people um, make use of something, uh, make use of it for something at their own place or, you know.
Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jane Blackwood. I work for Marfan Aboriginal Shire Council. Um, as Eli pointed out, like we just end up with mountains of net at the end of every net season, and I'm just going to talk about two of the livelihood options that derive from the Ghost Nets program and what we do with that net. Uh, we did use to burn it, much to our disgust as well, but there didn't seem a likely option to get it off the beach. As Eli explained, those beaches are a long way from anywhere. But now we do spend the time and the money and we load it all up off the beach, put it in the back of the ute, unload the ute, put it into the barge, take it off the barge, put it back in the ute and take it all the way back to the base. So we can't bury it and we can't burn it. So um, the Ghost Net Art Project arose from this conundrum of just what to do with the mountains of Ghost Net and other marine debris that lands on our northern coastline every year that Indigenous rangers pick up. One suggestion put forward was to use the material for craft or art. Our Ghost Nets Australia coordinator, Ricky Gunn, took up the challenge and kicked off what was to become the Ghost Net Art Project. In 2006, Ghost Nets ran a competition designed for a sea change, looking for the best design of a product, reusing Ghost Nets that could be easily manufactured and sold by communities around the Gulf. Sydney-based artist Chantal Cordy won the prize with her design for a guitar strap using nets and other marine debris. As a result of this, she conducted a workshop on Hammond Island in Torres Strait to make flat woven bags. Due to Hammond Island artists continuing to make the bags, Ghost Nets Australia was still interested in the idea of investigating what else could be done in communities with ghost nets. In 2008, a scoping study in some Cape York and Torres Strait Island communities was sponsored to investigate other possibilities for ghost net use. Sue Ryan was appointed to do the study and went on to become Ghost Nets Australia Art Director. As a result of the scoping study, the first Ghost Net Art Workshop was conducted at Aracoon in June 2009. Uh, baskets from that workshop were displayed at the inaugural Cairns Indigenous Art Fair in that same year where they attracted a lot of attention and fetched surprisingly high prices. Invitations to exhibit works flowed and the Ghost Net Art Project was up and running. The Ghost Net Art Project focuses on those communities that have been identified as Ghost Net hotspots sponsoring workshops led by facilitators, contemporary fibre artists engage community members to create art, craft and functional pieces from ghost nets. The facilitators work with artists and weavers in communities to develop new skills while encouraging the use of traditional techniques and themes using ghost net as an art material. In our own community of Mapoon, uh, we have a number of artists, uh, the most uh, celebrated being Zoe de Jersey and Wetland Birds are a signature piece for Zoe's art. Works produced are marketed through various galleries and have proven to be very popular, uh, providing income for participating artists while doing much to increase public awareness of the ghost net menace. This is the sign on the front of our ranger building back in Mapu. Indigenous, indigenous artists who are involved in the program are paid to participate in public workshops, at exhibitions and festivals, and opportunities for cultural exchange have also arisen. Ghostnet art is something of a phenomenon with the body of work that is Australian Indigenous art. Five years ago, it did not exist as a defined form whereas anyone who attended the 2011 Cairns Indigenous Art Fair could not have avoided being impressed by the amount of ghost net art on display by many art centres from around Cape York and Torres Strait. Within only a few years its emergence, of its emergence, many of the Australia's major art institutions have acquired pieces for their collection. Even the British Museum has purchased a piece. One important benefit of the art program has been to inform the Australian public of the threat that ghost nets pose to already endangered marine animals. 
Many people in the wider Australian community do not know what a ghost net is. The Ghost Net Art Project alerts the community to a global issue with a local solution. The program works directly with 20 Indigenous communities from Queensland and Northern Territory. Other communities, after seeing what can be done with GhostNet, have started using GhostNet and marine debris in their work. Uh, many have their own individual styles and ways of um, making products, from baskets right through to puppets and large-scale collaborative sculptures. Through this evolving and exciting market for Indigenous artists, many people earn considerable amounts of money. Future directions lie in promoting and exhibiting the continuing body of art that is being produced, and curriculum materials are being developed nationally to educate school children about the threats and impacts of ghost nets. Uh, this is a book that we put out last year, and if anybody's interested in reading more about the the uh, story from picking it up off the beach to becoming a, a saleable piece of art. There's three copies which I'll have up the front here after the talk. Just switching over now to a second livelihood that's much more uh, in my experience realm is the, um, is the livelihood options that it creates for ranger groups around the Gulf. Uh, this talk is delivered under the resources and livelihoods theme and it's an interesting story where a threat has uh, become an opportunity. The program has supported livelihoods within all Gulf of Carpentaria communities where ranger programs exist by providing fee-for-service contracts to remove ghost nets from their beaches. These annual contracts assist rangers and communities to prioritise and deliver the service of clean sweeping their beaches of nets annually. Land and sea programs invoice for the fee once the work is complete. This is a really good model for Indigenous ranger groups and allows for uh, flexibility and expenditure of those fees that they earn. How they spend the money is up to them. It's a win-win situation where ranger groups get resources, the program receives a receives the data it needs to solve the problem and the threat is removed. Fee-for-service contracts allow us more mileage out of our work programs. In Marpoon, net contracts support turtle work, shorebird and beach bird nest counts, junior ranger camps, back to country trips and elder days on difficult to access beaches. Organisations such as Ghost Nets have kept on-ground ranger groups trained and informed of the larger picture that we're all working to, together to reduce. This regionally coordinated approach has established a golf-wide network where rangers and artists meet and exchange and assist each other with the task of getting nets off the beach and providing a resource for artworks. Many coastal ranger groups started with Ghost Net Ghost Nets is a major part of their work program because the support and partnership was there from the beginning. 26 <coughs> ranger groups are currently engaged by Ghost Nets Australia in fee-for-service contracts to remove net and the work gets done. This business model is a successful step in the right direction for empowering remote communities to break into business arrangements such as the delivery of environmental services. Despite its huge success, <coughs> the fee-for-service model has not readily been picked up by other organisations looking to develop capacity and excellence <coughs> in other parts of the Ranger Work Program. Future direction is unclear as funding for this initiative will be discontinued after June 30th this year. Thank you to all those who supported us in coming here to share this story and good afternoon. If there's any questions, we have some ghost net samples down the front here. We also have the, um, the book that we use to catalogue our nets, um, and we're open for any questions that you might have. We also have our coordinator sitting in the front row over here who can also answer questions.
Kara Koko. Um, thank you very much. I find um, ghost nets, what you're doing is really inspiring. The question I'm asking um, in relation to what you were saying before, where you know that the percentage of nets are coming from Southeast Asia, has there been government, I'm asking you probably a dumb New Zealand question, is, has there been conversations with the Indonesian government or other governments with Australia about this massive problem? Okay, this is a problem, this is a question, it's a good, great question and I'm going to handball it to Ricky Gunn, the coordinator of Ghost Nets Australia, who will come on stage, please. Um, Ricky's been working with the program since 2004 and been the steering driver of Ghost Nets Australia. Um, our program, as you can see from this slideshow, has multiple fingers coming out. It's a really diverse program. We, ha we span art, we span environment, we span culture and capacity building. Um, and now we're going international because that's what our problem is. Here's Ricky Gunn. We had similar started with a tricky question. Um, as Jen explained, we've done some workshops in the Arafura Sea region. Uh, we have one workshop planned for July, um, which is has been funded by uh, the Department for Environment as a separate thing. And this workshop brings together champions that we have identified through our previous workshop um, that work in various fisheries around the Arafura Sea to talk about um, in more depth about the causes of lost net. And those causes are, are mainly to do with fishing pressure that are to do with gear conflicts, you know, sort of um, some of the, the gill netters were telling us stories about how um, the trawlers were just driving through their nets, cutting them in half. So, you know, half drifts off and the half still attached to the boat. Um, they, they were telling us stories about how some of the um, trawl companies are uh, illegal in themselves, where they, they're, they're using too big a gear that you know, it's getting snagged and they're in too shallow water and, and all sorts of stuff like that. At this workshop where we bring these people together, this is just the first, this is just a small step. At this workshop, uh, there will be um, uh, members from the Indonesian government uh, Ministry of Fisheries attending. We have always um, included in our workshops um, people from the fisheries, the you know, the enforcement guys, the, the data collecting guys and all that sort of stuff, locals, but at this workshop coming, we're going to bring in the people from Jakarta. Does that answer your question? Yep. That's fair, I'm, I'm hiding. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Thank you. Um, just, just listening um, if the funding like if the funding will end at the end of June will the program still continue? That's, that's the question that's on everybody's minds and everybody's hearts. It's an incredibly successful program. Over 12,000 nets a huge amount of capacity building and some groups are only just at the point now where they're beginning to clean, have a completely clean net at the end of a season. We've cleared the backlog. It's taken years. And now we can really see the patterns that are coming in, but we need more time to do it. Um, I've talked to some of our organisations, such as the Mapoon Rangers and, and many others, and they say, of course, if there's time, we will still do the work. We will still clear the nets off the beach, but if some other contract comes along that's going to pay us to do some work, of course the non-paid component's going to be shunted back, you know, the non-funded, the one that, that can't keep going. So, so to an extent, you know, maybe they'll have to shrink the capacity that they're currently at and not cover all the territory that they do cover. It's very important to get out on those beaches and to, to get those nets. It's very important to stop them going back into the ocean environment 
um, where they'll get swept around the coast and continue their, um, their catch. For example, um, conversations with some Dimaru rangers told us that ever since the guys on the Western Cape of Queensland have been collecting a lot of ghost net, they've been receiving, anecdotally this is, less nets on the western side of the Gulf of Carpentaria. So what's happening on the east part of that gulf is impacting what's happening on the west. We're making a difference. It'll be a very sad thing if this program stops running. Our time, I'm sorry. Uh, we've been given the signal to stop. Um, we'll be down here on the left if you want to continue asking questions. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone.